Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearson Ed Excel, International AS Chemistry Unit 1, Potential Questions in any Chemistry Unit 1 paper. Let's begin with the first part. From topic 1, which is formally equations and amount of substance, I began by looking at atoms, elements and molecules. Here they could ask you about definitions of atoms, what are molecules and what are compounds. They could ask you to practice writing and balancing chemical equations, including state symbols. Here you need to know how to write ionic equations. They could ask you to practice writing equations from typical reactions between acids and metals. Of course, you know when metals react with acids, we produce salt and hydrogen. Metal oxides, when they react with acids, we produce salt and water. When metal hydroxides react with acids, we produce salt and water. And when metal carbonates react with acids, we produce salts, we produce carbon dioxide as well as water. And when metal hydrogen carbonates react with acids, we produce the same thing, salt, carbon dioxide and water. Please practice these reactions extensively in order to get the marks you require to get. So the next part, I expected to be asked to practice writing displacement reactions among metals as well as halogens. Remember, in halogens, the halogen that is below cannot displace the one above from its compound. You need to remember that displacement reactions uh, that are included in testing for carbon dioxide. Here we test for carbon dioxide using lime water and lime water is calcium hydroxide. You need to remember that lime water turns milky. The next part is testing for sulfates with barium ions. Here we use nitric acid followed by barium nitrate or you can use uh, hydrochloric acid followed by barium chloride. The next part is testing for halides using acidified silver nitrate. Here we use nitric acid followed by silver nitrate. And depending on the halide, we can observe a white precipitate, a cream precipitate, or a yellow precipitate. You also need to know about questions uh, that are required in measuring the height of a precipitate and calculation of moles of the products that can be obtained. For this part, this in the, in the textbook, this is connected to Precipitation reactions, please revisit that and practice because it came in one of the papers last year. The next part is about calculations. They could ask you to calculate the number of moles from masses. You need to know the number of moles is mass divided by molar mass. And you need to know that the units for moles are mole. You need to know how to calculate the percentage yield, which is equal to actual yield divided by theoretical yield times 100. Sometimes they'll give you the actual yield and ask you to calculate the theoretical yield or they can give you the actual yield and ask you to calculate the percentage yield. Based on the experimental information given, you could use it to find the theoretical yield as well. When we go to atom economy, you need to know the formula for calculating atom economy. In this case, we consider the desired product. So it's going to be molar mass of the desired product divided by the molar mass of all products times 100. When we go to the empirical formula calculation, they can give you specific data of specific reactions that took place, and they can give you the percentage by mass, or they could give you other percentages and ask you to calculate and get the empirical formula. And from that empirical formula, you could be asked to get the molecular formula if they gave you the molecular mass. They can ask you about calculation of moles or number of moles using the ideal gas equation. Remember, this is PV is equal to NRT. You need to know the interconversion of units in order to suit them for the calculation. And sometimes they can ask you to find the number of moles or they could ask you to find something else. If the information is given, use that appropriately in that equation. And please remember the units that you have to convert the components into. The next part is about calculating number of moles and volume of a gas at room temperature and pressure. Here we use the formula number of moles is equal to volume of gas divide by molar volume. Be very careful about the molar volume you use. If you use 24 decimeters cubed, it means the gas volume is also going to be in decimeters cubed. And if you use a molar volume of 24000 centimeters cubed, it means the volume of the gas obtained is also going to be in centimeters cubed. The next part, they can ask you about calculating concentration of solution, about mass concentration and molar concentration. You need to know that mass concentration is going to be grams per decimeter cubed and molar concentration is going to be mole per decimeter cubed. Lastly here, they can ask you about concentration in parts per million. 
you need to know the formula for calculating this and answer suitably depending on the question that is asked to you. Moving on to topic two. Topic two, atomic structure and the periodic table. Here they can ask about the atomic structure and mass spectrometry. So we need to know about the relative charge and masses of electrons, protons as well as neutrons. Please remember that electrons have a charge of minus one, protons have a charge of plus one, and neutrons have no charge. You need to learn about isotopes and how we can use the isotopic masses to calculate a specific molecular mass that is required. We need to know the details of mass spectrometry, like vaporization, ionization. You need to know about the importance of the magnetic field as well as the electric field. You need to know that deflection is based on the mass to charge ratio. Smaller or lighter masses are going to be detected faster in comparison to those that are heavier. And that is why the molecular ion peak is always at the far end. You need to practice drawing mass spectra and representing the isotopic and molecular ion peaks for bromine as well as chlorine. These are very common asking about bromine and chlorine. So you need to fully understand them. And you need to know when you draw, you need to show the relative abundance. From the next part about quantum shells, orbitals, and electronic configuration, you need to know how to draw S and P orbitals. Remember, they will not ask you to draw D orbitals, so just S and P. Remember the S orbitals are circular or also spherical, and the P orbitals look like dumbbells, so you need to know how to draw them. You need to learn how to write the electronic configuration of elements until krypton. So in this case, you need to remember that there are some anomalies around chromium and copper. Chromium is for S1, 3D5, and then copper is for S1, 3D10. You need to remember that. You need to learn to write the electron in the box configuration or electron in the box notation of writing electronic configurations. Remember Hunt's rule? And this states that the electrons will occupy singly before pairing occurs, that is, in case we have subshells that are being filled or a subshell that is being filled, electrons are going to occupy the orbitals in that specific half shell as singlets before pairing occurs. And again, about Pauli's exclusion principle that talks about electrons filling as opposite spins within a specific orbital, you need to learn about ionization and how equations are written in gaseous state. Remember when you're writing an equation to represent ionization, everything is going to be in gaseous state, whether they're atoms or they're ions. We need to know the detailed description and explanation for successive ionization energies. Remember to describe how they occur and the details for each explanation in terms of orbitals, in terms of subshells, as well as the specific energy levels. We need to know the trends in first ionization energy. These trends include down the group as well as across the period. Detailed explanation for these in terms of the nuclear charge, in terms of the atomic radius, and in terms of the shielding effect. You need to know trends in atomic radii, again down the group and across the period, and these are going to be based on the same principles, shooting effect, nuclear charge, as well as atomic radius. We need to know the trends in boiling and melting temperatures across period 2 and 3. Now across period 2 from left to right, you know the left side has metals. Uh, to the far right, we have the halogens as well as the nonmetals basically. And those are going to be simple molecules. So you need to know the trend. Simple molecules, they have only London forces, at least in period two and three. And then in the middle, we have the giant structures like um, carbon, where they have multiple covalent bonds that have to be broken. And that is why their melting temperatures are going to be high. And the other side where we have the metals, they only have metallic bonding and they're giant structures. So the melting point is going to be a little bit high, but not as high as that of uh, group four at least in period two and three. The next part, they'll ask you about factors that affect the magnitude of fast ionization energy. And again, here I say it in terms of nuclear charge, shielding effect, as well as the atomic radius. So that's it for topic two. Let's continue to topic three. Topic three, bonding and structure. Here they can ask about ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and metallic bonding. In ionic bonding, they can ask about how ionic compounds are represented in dot and cross diagrams. Here you need to know that we put square brackets around the ion and then position the charge outside. Ionic compounds do not touch when we represent them as dot and cross diagrams. You need to learn that strength of a bond correlates to the amount of energy needed to separate that bond. 
if you require a lot of energy to separate a bond, then that bond is strong. You need to know evidence for existence of ions and how it can be demonstrated using electrolysis or using electron density maps. Electrolysis is displayed on page 68 of your textbook, and you can see this when you observe the color changes when copper sulfate and chromate are electrolyzed. We need to know the trends in ionic red eye down the group as well as across the period. They can ask you about polarization and polarizing power. You need to remember that for this to be explained, we need a cation that has a higher charge and a smaller size, as well as an anion that has a higher charge and a bigger size. You need to remember that polarization creates covalent nature in ionic compounds. You need to know explanations for physical properties of ionic compounds. Number one, why do they have high melting temperatures? This can be explained because ionic compounds are giant structures with multiple ionic bonds and those multiple bonds that are strong require more energy to be broken. That is why their boiling temperature is really or melting point is really high. They can ask you to explain why they are brittle. This is easy to explain because we know ionic compounds, when a force is applied onto them, uh, they're gonna sh the structure shifts around, and when it shifts, similar charged ions are gonna come closer to each other. They will repel each other, and then the structure will break apart. They can ask you about electrical conductivity among ionic compounds. You need to remember that ionic compounds do not conduct electricity in solid state. However, in liquid state, as well as in aqueous state, they can conduct electricity. And the reason for that is because uh, the ions are going to be free to move. They ask you about the solubility of ionic compounds in water. And here I prefer you remember that ionic compounds dissolve in water because water molecules surround them and then energy is released, which we call hydration energy, that causes them to be pulled apart. When we go to covalent bonding, here they'll ask you about the details about overlap between two orbitals to form covalent bonds. This overlap could be between two S orbitals or it could be between S and P orbitals. And this, when it occurs, it forms sigma bonds. That overlap is usually endon overlap. With a sideways overlap, this occurs between P orbitals and this usually forms pi bonds. They'll ask you about electronegativity and polar covalent bonds. Remember the trend in electronegativity across the periodic table. It increases as you move to the right with fluorine being the most electronegative. You need to remember that electronegativity creates ionic nature in covalent compounds. And you know this is represented when they say they have dipoles or they become partially positive and partially negative. You need to learn to draw dot and cross diagrams for covalent molecules. Covalent molecules touch each other when you represent them as dot and cross diagrams. You need to remember there are molecules that do not follow the octet rule Actually, some molecules or some substances, or I'll say some elements, expand the octet when they form molecules. Remember, in a dative covalent bond, only one atom in a covalent bond donates both electrons. You also need to remember that aluminum chloride dimerizes in gaseous phase, and you need to learn how to draw the dimer. This has been brought several times. You need to remember using the electron pair repulsion theory to explain shapes of molecules. And remember, to draw all shapes of molecules, you need to remember their names and the corresponding bond angles. This question is very common. You need to remember that the V shape has a bond angle 104.5, the linear shape has a bond angle 180, the trigonal planar shape has bond angle, or trigonal planar has 120, the tetrahedral has 109.5, trigonal pyramidal has 107, and trigonal bipyramidal has 120 or 90 then octahedral has 90 or 180. You need to fully understand how to tell polar molecules apart from non-polar molecules. If they are symmetrical and the dipoles cancel out, then it's going to be non-polar. But if they are symmetrical, but the dipoles reinforce each other, then the molecule is going to be polar. When we go to metallic bonding, they'll ask you to draw and label or to show how metallic bonding can be represented to get, usually this is a three mark question, to get it right, you need to show all the cations to be similar in size and the number of the cations as well as the electrons that have been lost have to make sense. If you create cation like succors of two plus, it means each has to be losing two electrons and you make sense when you draw them. 
you also need to label the delocalized electrons to get full marks. So practice writing segments or written segments to explain the physical properties of metals. Remember, they can ask you why metals have high melting and boiling temperatures. Here you need to talk about the fact that they are giant metallic structures with multiple metallic bonds that require more energy to be broken. They can ask you why metals have good electrical properties. You need to talk about the fact that they have delocalized electrons and when a potential difference is applied across the metal, then these electrons are going to flow. They can ask you why metals have good thermal properties. And again, this is going to be explained in terms of the free electrons as well as the closely packed ions. They ask you why metals are malleable and ductile. Here we will talk about that localized electrons having the ability to move along with the cations when a force is applied, holding the cations in position because they have different charges and therefore allowing the structural integrity to be held when the lattice or the structure shifts around. They will ask you about solid lattices, like you need to know about giant metallic structures, that all the all metals are giant metallic structures, giant ionic structures, of course, or ionic compounds. But giant covalent have examples of diamond, graphite, silicon dioxide, graphene, and so on. Please revisit your book to look at all these. And then they can ask you to compare and contrast physical properties of diamond and graphite. Please remember that graphite conducts electricity, diamond does not. Diamond has a higher melting and boiling temperature in comparison to graphite. But you need to remember explanations for physical properties of simple molecules. Remember, simple molecules only have weak intermolecular forces of attraction, and these require less energy to be broken. So this is the end of topic three. Continue to topic four. Topic four, organic chemistry of alkanes. We need to know the general introduction, including naming and isomerism. We need to know that hydrocarbons have only carbon and hydrogen, and they can be saturated or unsaturated. You must know the differences between displayed formula, structural formula or formula, skeletal formula, empirical formula, and molecular formula. You need to know what are homologous series. You need to learn how to name organic compounds like alkanes using the IUPAC rules. We need to learn how to identify the longest chain using prefixes like chloro and bromo, suffixes like all, in, and so on. And you need to use locants. These are used when atoms or groups have different locations on the carbon chain. And then learn how to use multiplier prefixes, including di, tri, tetra, and so on. And learn how to use IUPAC rules to write formally if names are given. For example, if they ask you to write the formula of 1, 2, dibromobutane, you need to be able to write that. And you need to remember to write possible isomers from a given molecule or molecular formula, including cycloalkanes. When we go to types of reactions in organic chemistry, remember there are addition reactions. You need to know about substitution reactions. You need to know about oxidation reactions. In oxidation reactions, they use oxidizing agents like manganate or dichromate. And you need to know the products that are formed in these reactions. You need to know there are reactions called reduction reactions, where reducing agents like hydrogen can be used. One example is alkenes reacting with hydrogen in the presence of nickel to produce alkenes. You need to know about polymerization reactions. Homolytic fission. In this case, molecules react by splitting in the presence of UV to form free radicals. And then hydrolytic fission. Here, ions are formed. You need to know the differences between electrophiles and nucleophiles. When we go to hazards, risks, and risks assessment, we need to know the difference between a hazard and a risk. Remember, the chemicals have the hazard and the hazard doesn't change, but the risk depends on the user. It can change depending on where, whether you have taken control measures to protect yourself, like using a film cupboard, and so on. You need to know about hazard symbols and their meanings like for corrosion, acute toxicity, oxidizing, flammable, and so on. You need to learn control measures to minimize the risks, like using a film cupboard, using gloves, wearing a mask, and avoiding an open flame by maybe using an electric heater. They can ask you about alkanes and crude oil. Here you need to know the details of fractional distillation, cracking, the possible products that are formed in cracking. And please remember that during cracking, a catalyst is used. You could use zeolite. 
or what you call silicon dioxide mixed with aluminium oxide and this process requires heating you need to remember why reforming is carried out as well as its effects on boiling point again remember branching decreases the boiling point we go to alkanes as fuels you need to learn about incomplete and complete combustion reactions including balanced equations remember when incomplete combustion takes place you could produce carbon dioxide carbon monoxide as well as carbon but for complete combustion we only produce carbon dioxide and water you need to remember that oxides of sulfur oxides of nitrogen carbon monoxide are harmful gases from car exhaust pipes and uh, catalytic converters are used to purify these exhaust gases by removing some of these gases of course they may not remove sulfur dioxide but they can remove carbon monoxide and oxides of nitrogen you need to know that catalytic converters use catalyst like platinum palladium and rhodium you need to know the reactions that occur in a catalytic converter to convert carbon monoxide as well as oxides of nitrogen to carbon dioxide and nitrogen you need to learn about biofuels and hydrogen as alternative fuels and please remember the advantages and disadvantages of using biofuels like the yield the land use and its effects carbon neutrality and the cost of transportation you need to know the advantages and disadvantages of using hydrogen as a fuel in this case please remember hydrogen is a gas and it may need to be compressed as well as the storage because it's easily combustible down here we talk about substitution reactions in alkanes please remember about initiation where homolytic fission takes place in the presence of uv to produce free radicals and how these free radicals react with the alkanes in propagation reactions or propagation steps so here you need to learn at least to write two propagation steps and then termination steps where the free radicals come together to form non-radical substances and here you need to practice writing at least three termination steps topic five alkenes you need to learn naming as well as isomerism know that alkenes have carbon carbon double bonds and you need to learn naming alkenes using the IUPAC rules you need to know that compounds with carbon carbon double bonds and uh, higher priority groups on each of the carbons around that carbon carbon double bond are going to be geometric isomers so practice naming these using the easy system as well as the cis and trans naming system when we go to reactions and mechanisms in alkenes you need to know a question can come on mechanisms usually in the exams so you need to fully understand every step until the formation of the final product please do not forget to put special charges the sigma plus as well as sigma minus around the incoming molecule as it attacks the carbon carbon double bond you need to know about hydrogenation uh, here adding hydrogen using nickel catalyst the mechanism for this reaction is not required for halogenation the mechanism is required and remember in this case uh, halogens are going to be added please remember the mechanism of this hydration addition of water molecules or water to the alkene in the presence of phosphoric acid as a catalyst making alcohols the mechanism for this is not required addition of hydrogen halides the mechanism for this is very important however sometimes we can produce one product or two products depending on the reaction or reactants if the alkene is symmetrical then only one product is going to be made when you add the hydrogen halide however if the alkene is not symmetrical then two products can be made making these products depends on the mechanism or the major product made here depends on the mechanism lastly they can ask about oxidation reactions where alkenes are oxidized to diols this mechanism is not required however you need to know the observation that the color changes from purple to colorless it ask about polymerization reactions so please practice drawing repeat units for polymerization reactions as well as if you're given the polymer and asked to write out the monomers used you need to be able to derive the monomers from the polymer they can ask you dealing with polymer waste so please practice explanations relating to the following number one about recycling number two about incineration you need to know the advantages and disadvantages of using all these methods and lastly biodegradable polymers this is a solution that can be used but is it achievable you need to talk about those discussions if questions are asked so this brings us to the end.
of this part for the unit one. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.